every available grandstand seat around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, an overflow crowd restlessly awaits the dawning of the first 200 mile per hour lap. Here is the great Peter Upson of Redondo Beach, and the green flag is on Eddie if Indy's 200 mile per hour barrier is to be smashed, it will take someone with the sensitive skills and expertise of Gulf McLaren driver Peter Revson. In the 1972 500 mile race, he finished second. As a rookie in 1969, Revson lined up 33rd, then pushed through the pack to place fifth. Revson knows Indianapolis. So does Johnny Rutherford, his Gulf McLaren teammate. average speed of over 192 miles per hour puts Revson dramatically into the 1973-500. He'll start 10th. But this year's really blood-boiling speeds are yet to come, as Revson knows. Briefly, a gloomy shower blunts further qualification attempts. But suddenly, the speeds rise. 14 drivers grapple to attain 200 and fail. Finally, Johnny Rutherford gets saddled up. At 200 miles per hour on the two and a half mile speedway, a racing car travels the length of a football field a second. Concentration becomes complete. And the difference between success and failure is measured by a driver's heartbeat. Rutherford needs a lap time of 45 seconds on the button. His opening lap speed of 198 and a half misses it. Then his second drops off to 197. setting up on the pole position at this point in time or something is falling off of the car. Rutherford's stupendous four lap average of over 198 miles per hour is only a heartbeat away from 200. But it brings him the pole position and makes him the fastest qualifier in the history of the speedway. And the crowd, suddenly exhausted and sobered by the speed onslaught, take stock. Bobby Unser and Mark Donahue, both former winners, will balance the record-busting Rutherford along the 500's front row. But the 500-mile sweepstakes are by tradition cruel on pole position drivers like Rutherford. In 57 races, only nine men who've started on the pole have gone on to finish up inside victory lane. In Gasoline Alley, impeccable mechanics work round the clock. But unlike the high-strung drivers, they stay relaxed and loose. Dennis Davis, chief mechanic for Rutherford. Basically, I don't have too much to do with the policy of how the car runs or anything like that. Make sure the guys do the things the way I'd like them done. 
If it falls on its face, well, it's down to me, and if it goes good, they say it's also down to me. Morning. Two days before the 500, the wings are set, and powerful engines given a final tweak. Time to check it all out. Mechanics roll their splendid 200 mile per hour charges out for a last run. And once again, the tension becomes palpable. Drivers Rutherford and then Repson go to work. To really memorize the behavior of his car, a driver must ring it out brutally during these final carburation tests. And now, with the 500 barely two days off, Peter Repson shoves his foot into it. straight and I have a chance to glance at my board. I'm satisfied and uh, I feel this will be quite competitive for the race. sophistication. But to coax optimum performance and speed from the design, vigorous checking and rechecking is vital. Most important, a driver must be able to communicate with his mechanics, to exhort and encourage them just as they do him. Gulf's racing cars have been called laboratories on wheels because the development and improvement of petroleum products has always been an important objective of Gulf's motorsport program. 1973 is Johnny Rutherford's first on the Gulf McLaren team. He brings with him determination, dedication, and rock-rigid confidence in himself, gleaned from a decade on the hard-boiled dirt tracks. 1973 is Rutherford's 10th 500 and 15th anniversary as a race driver. Like Rutherford, Peter Repson possesses a wide repertory of skills. An internationally graded road racer, he's a past champion of the tough Canadian-American Challenge Cup series. But in a racing career that already has been stunning, victory at Indianapolis has so far been elusive.
Credible for the sixth time in 10 years and fourth year in a row, auto racing's million dollar marathon is ruptured by violence. 11 cars lay crippled and guillotined along the home stretch. And anxious drivers pitch in to achieve desperate repairs before the rains come. Two days, one aborted start, and several rain squalls later, the pack regroups. From the flying start, Bobby Unzer plunges to the lead. turn three, Unzer's opening lap burst is a record-setting 177 miles per hour. Attrition comes early for Bobby Allison, whose engine flames. Meanwhile, Rutherford, making a disciplined bid, bides his time in fourth but teammate Peter Revson is missing. Barely three laps into the race, a grinding brush along the wall demolishes half of Gulf McLaren's hopes. As Unzer and Mark Donahue hog the lead, a dozen drivers swap positions behind them. Edged tightly together in the corner, Bill Vukovic and Gordon Johncock clang wheels at nearly 180 miles per hour. At 60 miles, Unzer stops. And here comes Rutherford. Well-coordinated mechanics pounce under and over the car, accomplishing the impossible in seconds. The black flag. To sop up the nagging fuel leak, six laps go down the drain. Rutherford falls to the cellar. For others, the heartbeat 500 quickens. 1972 United States Auto Club champion Joe Leonard achieves a phenomenal recovery. But a few heartbeats later, at the head of the fourth turn, Swede Savage's fuel-swollen car cannot recover. Bewildered mechanics see still another fire flare in Al Unzer's car as the crisis marred 500 is aborted for the third time in three days. But an hour and 15 minutes later, with 300 miles to go and another storm front moving in, the war resumes with Unzer taking temporary command. Jimmy Carruthers' hopes disintegrate at the same moment. Rutherford, regaining his rhythm, catapults himself back inside the top 10. Al Unzer's blown engine at 300 miles finishes him, and the lead is passed back to Gordon Shonka. Rutherford scrambles to ninth as Bobby Unzer falls out. 
But a lashing rain is something even leader Gordon Johncock cannot outrun. And finally, at the 332 and a half miles, the red flag is waved in the rain and the race ends. But what is winner Gordon Johncock thinking now? About the rain? About the glory? Or is he, like the other rain-soaked survivors of the 57th Indianapolis, distinctly relieved that the 200-mile-per-hour heartbeats have eased?